Well, mates, it's time to sail the seas with our next experiment, buoyancy and stability. For a backdrop for this experiment, I'm using this photograph, and this experiment has always been had a special interest because my great-grandfather, George, was a naval architect, as was his brother, James. In fact, you can see one of his brother's papers he presented back in the 1890s on my website. George built many yachts, and actually that was his living for many years. This is one of them which he had, which was the Buena, and he is located right here near the bow, and his crew is behind him. And he, did, he was very successful in this. He actually oversaw the construction of and designed what amounted to one of Lake Michigan's first super yachts, the Pathfinder. And, the, and that yacht was, was very, very famous at the time. But it also had its downfalls because in the hands of a skipper that didn't know where he was going, it got lost. And that Pathfinder loss is a subject of one of my web pieces. And I use it as an advice to students of why you should not just copy somebody else's work. Because if you follow somebody that doesn't know where they're going, you're not going to get there where you want to go. I'm also going to use this photo to illustrate some nautical terms which you'll hear me use throughout the experiment. In the, here the ship is the bow, which is normally pointed, although in many cases like barges and the ship we're going to use for this experiment, it's not. And the stern is on the other end. Along here is the gunnel, which is usually, if it were pronounced phonetically, it would be gunwale, but the old saws called it gunnels, and that's what I'm going to call it. And this is the rim, uh, right, that, that basically bounds the deck, which, which is what my great-grandfather and his crew are standing on. The distance from the gunnel to the waterline here, which is what that is called, is referred to as the freeboard. And it's very important for a ship to have adequate freeboard because if it doesn't have adequate freeboard, you get in a storm, waves go over the top, and the ship goes to the bottom. But that's not the end of the ship because below this um, waterline, there, there's quite a bit below. And we're going to explore today in this experiment why that's so and why that is an essential part of buoyancy. And basically, along the, the very uh, lowest point and the, usually the very stiffest um, structural member along the bottom is called the keel, which, is, which we won't have to worry about with this experiment. But the, we're going to talk about why the, that area, that volume is important. And we're also going to talk about how ships such as this and others were stable remain stable in the water. These principles have understood a long time and many, much of the material I have on my website is old. I want to take a little bit different approach to this experiment. Instead of just a straight up lecture, I'm going to actually use the little ship that we have to demonstrate those principles. So let's go ahead and get started on that. This is the vessel we're going to be using today in our experiment. It's a very simple rectangular craft. And that simplifies the math considerably from what you normally get in ships. The, of course, today we have all kinds of nice computer graphics and I'm sure naval architects are very thrilled to have these. But in those days they had to use uh, literally splines and, cube, and literally cubic splines in order to do their, and other types of manual instruments to do their job. I still have, for example, my great grandfather's planimeter, which is, which he used in, in, in his designs. But in any event, let's go ahead and take some of the first measurements. You'll notice, and, I'll, and you need to look at my write-up on this and notice the variables. First, the beam of this ship, which is this way. And the beam of this particular craft is about 20.3 centimeters. I'm going to record everything in centimeters. I strongly suggest that you use 
CGS for this, not, not try to use MKS. You will have no end of problems if you try to use MKS. The length of this ship is about um, 36 centimeters. And the total distance from the bottom of the hull to the gunnel is about 7.6 centimeters. Now, this is where the first point of confusion comes. Because you'll notice in this bit, you've got this distance down to the waterline, and then there's more under the waterline which you can't see. In this particular case, you can see the whole thing. Many students confuse this distance with the distance between the D distance, which is actually between the waterline, which will come somewhere in this area and the bottom of the ship. The way we're going to determine that D distance is we're going to put this in the water and we're going to subtract the distance we just measured here from the distance from the gunnel down to the waterline. A few other things. This is the weight, which is, represents the cargo of the ship. And we're going to use this to determine the stability when we get to the metastatic center. This is an inclinometer, which we're going to use. We're going to shift this way from side to side. Uh, you'll notice that this has got a lot of fancy stuff up here. The, original, the way that the people who designed this experiment and this, and this experimental apparatus originally intended it, you had to go all the way through here and go up to determine, to, to determine the metastatic center. We're going to use the procedure which is well established in naval architecture and which the United States Navy uses to determine the the metastatic center of a ship which is unknown. So, and that only involves using one level, and we're going to use one level. Notice carefully that we have this little line here. This is the midships line. And this midships line is, is as, as the name implies, is the center of the ship. We don't, we normally like to load ships so that the um, so that the center of gravity in this direction across the beam is at midships, and that's where we're going to start. And we, we prefer to do that because otherwise we have a ship that lifts. And that's not very pretty and also makes it more susceptible to being turned over in high seas. So our general preference is to have the center of gravity across here amidships. And this is the way we're going to start with this weight. So that, in a nutshell, describes the, the various components of this vessel. The next thing we want to do is to weigh this ship. We're actually going to weigh it. We're going to weigh it, and we're going to weigh that cargo, which is right there. So let's go ahead and weigh the ship in grams. And according to this scale, the entire ship with cargo weighs 2,699 grams. Now we're going to take it off. I'm going to remove this weight. Oops. Put it back together, and we're going to weigh the weight by itself. And it weighs 391 grams. Notice that the weight of 390 is stamped on it, but one of the things we cannot do as engineers is just simply take stuff we see stamped or otherwise in blind faith. We need to be able to verify things. And that's an important part of engineering practice. One thing I've neglected to mention, I won't pick it up, is the fact that if you look down here and there, you'll see two little red weights. I said that we wanted to make sure that the ship was balanced this direction. I also really want to make sure it's balanced in this direction so I can take an accurate weight and when I put it in the water I will adjust those little red weights to make sure that that is the case. However, being careful, what I'm going to do when I actually measure the distance from the gunnel down to the water line is I'm going to do it at both both bow and stern. You can pick which is which. It's, there's no uh, preference one way or the other with this and I can take an average of those and I can find the average distance from the gunnel down to the waterline. 
But before I put this ship in the water, which I now have, there's one more thing I need to do. I need to measure, find out the center of gravity in this direction. I said that the center of gravity in this direction and the center of gravity in this direction should be set as close as possible to midships this way and midships this way. However, the one that it will not be that way is this. And this, of course, is where the issue of stability comes in. So I need to know the center of gravity with, notice that this cargo is at a certain level, and it is amidships itself. So the way I do that in this case is I pick this up, and I measure, and this is a little tricky, the distance from where this, this bob, we've got a, a weight, a plumb, a bob, that actually is, when it crosses the midship line, the distance from where this, the line, the center line of that plumb bob, or, or the string for that matter, crosses that to the bottom of the hull. That's the center of gravity from the bottom of the hull. And that's where another place for many students get into trouble, and I'll mention that in a minute. That particular distance is 5.5 centimeters in this case. So I'm going to go ahead and put this ship in the water, and then we're going to get it ready for the, the, stability, the buoyancy part of the experiment. Now I'm ready to measure, or actually I've already measured, I want to show you how it's done. The distance from the gunnel down to the water line. And basically I just take a ruler and I do it this way. I measure it and I check the, uh, the distance. And I do the same thing on the other end of the ship. I can, because I have a rectangular plan form and nice squared up dimensions, I can average those two dimensions. And those two dimensions for this particular ship are 3.9 uh, centimeters on one end and 3.6 on the other, so you can take and average those. Uh, this is a tricky measurement to do accurately, and it's one reason why you will see discrepancies between this and what, you're, what I'm about to tell you. This ship, when it's placed in the water, and it's hard to see, well, actually it's not hard to see. If you'll not, just watch carefully, as you place this ship in the water, this ship displaces water. You can actually, if you look carefully, you could see the water level rise in this. That's referred, that is the displacement of the ship. Archimedes' law states, and there's other ways of showing this, that the weight of the water displaced is equal to the weight of the ship. That's what make, that, that, that is flotation in a nutshell. Now, in order to check that, we took the weight of the ship conventionally to start with. But after that, we have to, to, to check the displacement. And the way you do that is you multiply, the volume of the ship in the water is simply equal to this distance here times this distance here, times the difference between this distance and the full distance from the gunnel to the bottom of the hull, which we measured earlier. It's the difference. That's where many students get trip up. They take this full distance, and that's not the case. It's the distance from this water line down to the, to, to, to the bottom of the hull. That volume, the way that, that water that that volume takes up should equal the weight of the ship. And it may be a little different. Like I said, this is not the easiest measurement to make. However, one of the things that makes it easy if you use CGS is that we have one gram per cubic centimeter of water density. And don't, don't get involved too much with, with gravity. I know this is weight. I know we're talking about mass dimensions. But um, there's a, if you divide G sub C out, everything comes out fine. Any event, you want to check to see if the dement, if the if the weight of the water displaced, which is the volume of the water displaced times its density, is equal to the weight of the, the weight of the ship. Sh they should be in theory equal. As you can see, taking measurements with these things is difficult. For example, when you take this measurement, do not actually use this end of the row. First, look at the right end of the row. That's good. 
hold, make sure when you do that, make sure you're not holding the ship. Make sure the ship is as still as possible. And you can see even now there's a little bit of, of fluctuation. And for that reason, I'm going to kind of, uh, that, that does the buoyancy. And now we're going to move into the stability part of the experiment. The key, there are several key quantities we under, need to understand in order to do stability calculations successfully, even for a simple vessel like this. The first one is we need to have some dimensions. The first one we actually, and we actually already looked at this, is the center of gravity. The distance from, say, the, I'm going to do the, distance, the location of the center of gravity in this direction. The second thing is the center of buoyancy. The center of buoyancy is the center point of what's underwater, of the part of the ship that's underwater. And in this case, it's equal to the draft of the ship divided by two. And that's measured again from the bottom of the ship. The third thing is the metastatic center. And the metastatic center is an important quantity which is kind of difficult to understand, but it is a measure of the ship's stability to rolling, and it's a function of moment. There are three conditions at the, of the metastatic height that you should be aware of that are especially important points. And, but one of them is actually concerns the center of gravity. If the center of gravity is below the center of buoyancy, the ship is unconditionally stable. It will not turn over. The type of vessels this generally applies to mostly are submarines. If, on the other hand, the center of gravity is below the metastatic height, the ship is conditionally stable. In other words, the ship will, under most conditions, not turn over. Uh, you know, as, as the condition is severe enough, any, any ship will turn over eventually, eventually, if it's in that condition, unless it's unconditionally stable. Last but not least, if the center of gravity is above the metastatic height, the ship is unconditionally unstable, and at any perturbation, and as you see, perturbations in the water are almost unavoidable. You see if I just do this and I got water, it's next to impossible to have purely still water under, under normal conditions. If that's the case, the ship will turn over unconditionally. There are three ways we're going to look at to determine the metastatic height of this particular vessel. The first one is the analytic method. And the analytic method basically states that the, um, the distance from the, the, from the center of buoyancy to the metastatic height is equal to the, the moment of inertia of the plant form, like you have in mechanics of materials, divided by the displacement volume of the ship. Well, you've computed the displacement volume, and actually you can compute the moment of inertia fairly easily because for a rectangle, it's bh cubed over 12. And in this case, it's actually, it's actually the length times this dimension cubed over 12. In other words, it's the length times the beam cubed over 12. You divide that by the displacement volume, you get the metastatic egg height from the center of buoyancy. It is very important that you take and subtract, you, you compute the center of gravity from in this area to the bottom of the ship. And you can compute the center of buoyancy the way I just described. If you subtract it to two, you have the distance from the center of gravity to the, to the center of buoyancy. And the, or another way of doing it is you take the distance from the center of buoyancy to the metastatic height. You subtract the difference between the center of gravity and the center of buoyancy, and you will get the distance from the metastatic height to the center of gravity. And that's your first one. And you should do it that way because the other two methods actually compute it using, or it's an experimental estimate, the distance between the metastatic height and the center of gravity, or GM. If you do, you must do all three on the same basis. If you don't, you're going to get a bad result, and you will not, and you may not understand why. But that's what you must do.
to put them all in the same datum. And so the easiest is, since two out of the three of the methods go from the center of gravity, just compute that from the center of gravity. All you have to do is to adjust your result from the analytic method from the center of buoyancy up to the center of gravity. We're going to measure the center of gravity using the weight shifting technique. And I have a description of that weight shifting technique on my website. It is the same one the US Navy uses, and I've used US Navy material and other material to put it together. It's very simple, but you have to, be, you have to pay attention to what's going on. All right, I said at the beginning that this weight is a midships in the center, in the center of gravity. Each of these teeth and each of these, the gap between the teeth are 0.75 centimeters apart. What I'm going to do is I'm going to move this weight, two teeth, or 1.5 centimeters. Now, whether it's, and of course, at the right or the left in the description, if this was the old saw, it'd be port or starboard. The problem with a symmetric like this is it's hard to know which is port or starboard. So we're just going to make it easy on everybody and say we're going to go right or starboard first, and then I'm going to go back to center, and I'm going to go port or left next. I'm going to do this in 1.5 centimeter increments. I'm going to take a series of photos because as you can see, taking this, th these dimensions is very difficult because of the fact that the ship almost never really comes to rest. So in order to make data measurements a little simpler, I'm going to simply take photographs of at the at data points. I'm going to take a first photograph. Obviously here it's at zero, so we won't take that photograph. Um, my first photograph is going to be a 1.5 centimeter to the starboard. The next one is three to the starboard or the right. The next one is 4.5. And I'm going to keep going until I get, I, I might be able to get six centimeters out of it. And I might not. Any of that I'm going to see, the, the next one you'll see is 1.5 centimeters to the left of the port. And then three centimeters, 4.5 and maybe six. So let's go ahead. I'm going to take a series of photos and I'm going to, and you're going to have to follow those photos as I go over and take measurements off of this inclinometer, which is in degrees down here. The last method we're going to use to determine the distance between the center of gravity and the metastatic center is kind of an informal old salts method called the roll time method. And this eventually involves checking to see what the roll time is from basically, if it starts at from one side, it rolls to the other, and then it comes back. And it, this is very imprecise. The results you may get may not be the most satisfactory. Uh, we use the roll, we estimate the roll time, and we can actually do this the other way, which is to know knowing the metastatic center, determine the roll time as part of design, particularly with yachts. Yachts are designed to be nice um, cruising vessels that provide comfort. And that's also true with cruise ships as well. However, uh, yachts are, well, you see a lot of the super yachts now, but many yachts are not very large. And if they're, the way, and the way in which they roll is determined by their, uh, met, by their roll time metastatic center. Some yachts have, where, and I didn't actually go into this some, both on the website and the procedure, some yachts are set up to, well, they kind of tend to have a, a very, they tend to roll over and then they check, they come back very violently. 
that's very hard to take in a high city. Not much easier is the other extreme where they essentially roll over as much as, you know, to a, they have a very smooth rolling, but they go over very far, and that's not very fun either. And I've experienced both in the years on the water. So, with that in mind, we're going to use the roll time check in. Like I said, this is not the most precise thing, but what we're going to do, and I'm going to do this three times, is the following. We're going to start with the ship. What I want you to do is to use the video to measure the, the time from this, to, this all the way over and all the way back is the roll time. And then you use the equations in your procedure on my website to estimate the metastatic center from the metastatic height down to the center of gravity. I will note because of the shape of this hull, this doesn't always work very well. And I also note something else. Because of the fact that the, the tub I was using is so small, what would happen when we first did this is that the waves would reflect off the back and they'd mess the results up. So I'm using a little bit bigger pond in this case, which is we're going to be seeing this again when we get the hydraulic jump. So we're going to go ahead and roll this over. I'm just going to let it roll. I'm going to let it go. And okay, that's one. And then two, we'll do this again. Again, the trick is, is to get this thing going without um, effect, with, without actually having water come over the gunnel and affect the, and take water on. That really screws the results up. That screws a lot of things up on a ship. And last, we'll go one more time with the roll time. You can use your video to time it or whatever method you like to use to time it. I've seen several different types of timings used on the roll time. I would use the, the largest roll first. The small one should give the same result, but it's easier to measure if you're dealing with a, uh, a roll, if you're dealing with the largest one. And that concludes the experiment. Uh, there's a couple, a couple of things I want to make mention of in closing. One of them is, as you see, I had to secure the, uh, bob, the bob for the inclinometer in order to make sure it didn't bang during the operation. It's important when you go to sea to make sure that all things are secured before you hit the water. Otherwise, your stuff will go everywhere and you'll have a mess. That's just uh, advice to those of you who get into boating. Number two, many of you have noticed how not terribly accurate some of these measurement systems are, and they're not. However, um, and I understand, uh, many professors may, but I understand that these methods are not the most accurate. They just aren't. And so I think, I, however, I see greater problems with the students messing up the way they process data than the way they take data. If they take data according to the procedure, then they will have, uh, then they have a better shot. But if they take good data and then screw it up in processing, they can have larger errors that way than they can the way they take the data. So it's important to take data properly, but it's also important to understand the limitations of the data collection system that you have. If you understand those limitations, then it makes it a lot easier when it comes time to take the, when it comes time to actually process the data. And of course you can use statistical methods to actually look out for those and to account for those. So in any event, that's the conclusion of buoyancy and stability. I hope you enjoyed our sea voyage. Um, Thanks for watching and God bless.